When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a reminder that the Crime Aid acronym stands for Crime Reduces Innocence Makes Everyone Angry, I Declare. Here is the captain. Yeah, it's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we got a little leftover blueberry cobbler. That's Grandma Finger's pastry sour beer with blueberries, of course. This is another good one from Arcane Ale Works. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And let's give some cheers to our friends right here. First up, a big cheers and thank you to Cheryl in Kimberly, British Columbia. And a big we like your jib to Victoria and Virginia Beach. And here's a, of course we like your jib to Andrea White and St. Mary's County, Maryland. And a big shout out to Jason in Savannah. Here's a cheers to Constantinos in Squirrel Cove, British Columbia. And last but certainly not least, we have a double cheers to Dan and Ruth in Republican City, Nebraska. Thank you all for helping us out with this week's beer fun. Yeah, B W E Double R U N Beer Run. If you want to support the show, go to iTunes, give us a five star review. Tell them that you love us and make sure you subscribe to the show make sure you tell a friend and for everything True Crime Garage check out our website truecrimegarage.com and that is enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Where we left off from yesterday, Captain, is we have a young woman who was abducted and managed to escape her attacker. When she tells police and detectives about what happened to her, she is able to give them detailed information that lead them to a man named Robert C. Hansen. Do you know what the C is for? It stands for, oddly enough, Christian Mm. is Robert Hansen's middle name. Now, Robert Hansen, the general thought or what is known of this guy around Anchorage, Alaska, he's a family man, a businessman, and he, on the surface, everything the investigating officers know about Robert Hansen is telling them he wasn't their guy. And when I say he wasn't their guy, meaning he might have been involved in this incident regarding Cindy Paulson. But he's probably not their guy for the other missing women and for the bodies that are turning up. Robert Hansen is a family man and a successful local businessman. He owned a bakery, and when the detective ran Robert Hansen through their computer system, which we need to point this out, 
It's very important to point out that at this time in our timeline, that this very moment, the Anchorage police were in the process of switching to a new system. So when they type in his information into their computer system, the system tells them that Robert Hansen was clean. He didn't have any police record at all. And when the detectives started to ask around, what they end up learning is that Hansen was known around town as a, an expert hunter. And in fact, he held several very impressive hunting records, several world records for bow and arrow hunting. In fact, he held the world's top mark for taking down a doll sheep by bow and arrow. This was in 1971 for killing a ram with a 42 inch horns. He held the number two record for caribou. The number 12 ranked in the world for mountain goat, the number 13 ranked doll sheep, and the 34th ranked black bear. I'm like 197 for killing a big ass spider. So this is a hunter's paradise, and he's a very skilled hunter. Well, and all we can assume is that their law enforcement system is not connecting them to other counties, you know, especially during this time. So. Basically, what they're saying is he's clean. Once he moved to Alaska, he's clean, and he's been a good, upstanding citizen. Yeah, the trouble, the short of it, Captain, will be that they were in the process of setting up their computer system. It wasn't quite finished yet, and so some of the records had not made their way to that system. Well, if they need a guy. So they were not able to find them at that very moment when they're looking this dude up whose vehicle and plane put him at the airfield of where this Cindy Paulson escaped from. So a quick background on Robert Hansen. He was born in Iowa in 1939. His parents, with whom he had a difficult relationship with, were very strict and often made him work long hours at the family-owned bakery. During his childhood, he was often bullied for his stutter and severe acne. In school... He had no close friends. After graduating high school in 1957, he enlisted in the U.S. Army Reserve, where he became a skilled marksman, serving one weekend a month and working at the bakery the rest of the time, sometimes volunteering as an assistant drill sergeant at the police academy in the town of Pocahontas. It was in the Army Reserves one weekend that Hansen lost his virginity to a working girl. Then in 1960, he fell in love with and married a local girl. Soon after, Hanson burned down the school bus garage of the local high school. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Well, is there a reason? Did he ever tell us? Did he ever say the reason? So, this is a really kind of long and weird story. So, he's working at the bakery. And now, mind you, by this time, he's graduated high school, he's in the Army Reserve, and he's an adult, but he's a young adult. He must be about uh, 18-ish, 19 at this time. At this point, he's officially in charge of making Cinnabons. Yeah. Well, this is 1960, so he would be 21. He's actually a couple years older than what I thought he was. Mm. He's look, he's working for mom and dad at the bakery. And so when you think about like these local mom and pop sh- shops, you have a lot of teenagers that tend to work these jobs. Right. So he's working with a couple of kids that are still at the high school. They're still active in the high school, 17-ish, 18-ish. And he is kind of, because he's older than these guys, they think of him differently, much differently than what his classmates thought of Robert when he was attending high school. Right. His classmates thought of him as a giant pimple. Well, and at the bakery, he's a bit of a somebody, right? He's the owner's son. He's an adult. He's gone off to the Army Reserve. He has life experiences. He's a part-time drill sergeant at this uh, police academy. Yeah, so now he's Mr. Pimplehead. So he kind of creates this little clan amongst the young men that work there, 16, 17, 18-year-old boys. You know, they're all very rebellious, want to raise a little hell. He convinces them, hey, like, we could go out and do some stuff 
in this little town in Iowa where there's nothing to do. You know, we could go out and shoot at things, shoot at stop signs. We can uh, set things on fire. There's ways that we can have fun, be rebellious, and, you know, cause problems. Yeah, jerk off some goats. So he convinces a couple of the guys that work there at this bakery that, you know what, let's get together and we'll stake some places out and we can do this or that or the other thing. Check out some goats. A couple of the guys are smart enough to weasel their way out of these arranged hangouts that are after hours. You know, they're smart enough to know, hey, if we end up doing something bad, it could be bad for me. So I'm not going to put myself in this situation. One night, he and one of the boys that he convinced to go with them, they go to this garage that houses the buses that drive the kids to school. So this is school property. And he decides, Robert Hansen decides to set fire to the building. Now, there's some conflicting stories here, obviously, because we have two people that went there and they both have a somewhat different story of what happened. But after the building burnt down and the the vehicles inside were practically destroyed as well, I mean, this is a big deal with a lot of damage, a lot of a lot of cost involved in this damage. Well, because these other guys are teenagers. Well, what do they do? They, they run their mouth. You know, they're at parties or they're at school telling people, Hey, I know who did this, or I was involved or I was almost involved. And so they're kind of telling the story to these other people of what happened. The police and the school system really had no clue what happened other than they knew that it was not an accident, that it was set. It was an arson. Well, word starts to get around town that Robert Hansen was involved in this. And the kid that was with him on the night that they set the fire, he becomes a witness and testifies against Robert Hansen. So in court speak, Robert Hansen willfully and maliciously set fire to a building. This occurred in Iowa in 1961. For this, he gets a three-year sentence in prison. Remember, he's already married at this time. His wife decides to stick with him because she believes going off of what Robert's telling her and everyone else, Hey, this group of kids did it and they're trying to blame it on me. And because somebody's willing to testify against me, I'm taking the fall for these guys. Right. His family believes him and his wife believes that he's innocent, but eventually he ends up confessing to her and to his mom and dad. This is while he's serving out that, three-year prison sentence well and also you know the family business he's set to make some dough well you asked why it's believed that hansen burnt down the building in retaliation for his unhappy high school years or it was because he hated the school's superintendent who just so happened to be good friends with his father hansen's father and a regular customer at the family bakery either way Hansen ends up serving 23 months in a reformatory and then is released and then successfully completed parole one year later. So he got out early for this arson that he committed. Right. In 1963, he remarried because what happens is once he confesses to his wife and to his parents, she believing him this whole time, now she knows not only did he set this fire, not only is he an arsonist, but he's managed to lie to me for over a year now. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want anything to do with him. Those two split up. So after he gets out in 1963, he gets married again to a woman with whom he had two children with, a girl and a boy. In 1967, the Hanson family of four moved to Anchorage, Alaska. Now in Anchorage, Alaska, this is reported that, you know, Hansen was well liked by the people that knew him. And following in his father's footsteps, Hansen opened a bakery and the business was a success. Now, Hansen always had a hobby of target shooting and was pretty skilled at this. And he was always somewhat a casual hunter back in Iowa, but Alaska is a sportsman's paradise. Mm -hmm. So Robert Hansen became an avid hunter. Well, just to be clear, it's spelled H-A-N-S-E-N, -E not S-O-N, like the famous mm -bop. multiple talented group, Hanson. Dop, dop, doo -wop. 
Either way, it makes me think of that song. And we need to have their beer on the show called Oom Hops. A funny side thing was I was at the grocery last week and that song came on. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what anybody thinks. That's not my cup of tea that, you know, their style of music. But that song, regardless, puts me in a fantastic mood every time I hear it. That was their style of music when they were younger. they've They've gotten much better. If you haven't listened to new Hanson, you you might be surprised. I've been trying to talk about Hanson for almost 500 episodes. Once in Alaska, as we already pointed out, he becomes an avid hunter, breaking several hunting records, setting several hunting records, which we already listed some of his ranked records. But when the detective started asking other detectives, because keep in mind, still at this point, he's looking at this guy going, this guy's got a clean rap sheet. Why? All of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, this guy picks up a a woman at gunpoint and handcuffs her and does all these horrible things to her. We didn't go into detail, and I didn't think it was necessary, but it was a lengthy assault that he committed on this woman, according to what she's telling the detective. So the detective's going, yeah, you don't just go from being a a nice guy, family man, businessman. It's a brutal rape. One, yeah, one day to being a monster the next. Mm-hmm. So he starts asking the other detectives, like, hey, what I'm hearing about this guy and what I can see on paper isn't adding up. I mean, there was a hammer involved. About Robert Hansen. Mm-hmm. And he's, at some point, when he's talking to these old, skilled, seasoned detectives that have been around for a long time, he's starting to get less stories about Hansen's hunting records and more stories about Hansen's police record, right? Because we said that for whatever reason, those records hadn't made their way to their now computerized system. Right. One detective that he asked immediately referred to him as bad Bob Hansen. AKA man who jerks off goats. So the records having not been fully transferred yet, tell a very different story about this family man. We and the successful baker. We already mentioned this arson fire. Okay. But then we have a story out of 1972 or 73 where Robert Hansen got into some bad trouble. This was for two separate incidents. One for attempting to rape a housewife. And he was also caught for raping a sex worker. Now it's a little convoluted, but, but things seem to fall apart pretty quickly in both of these cases as they were trying to charge Robert Hansen with these two different crimes. From my understanding, Captain, they are very different crimes, especially the housewife crime, Mm -hmm. because this is a weird situation. And this might be his, if you want to use some air quotes here, his first sexual attack. We do not know for sure. But in this situation, he stops off at this woman's house and he says that he needs to use her phone for whatever reason that he, that he gives her. And I believe she allows him to use the phone and then he leaves without incident. He comes back to her place like 30 minutes later. Yeah. Well, I think the ruse was that, you know, cause his head's a big pimple is that he convinced her that a bee stung his face. And that's why his face looked like that. So he needed to call the hospital. The using the phone ruse might be to make sure that she's alone in the house. Yeah, or that. And so he comes back 30 minutes later, knocks on the door. She opens up. Boom, he's sticking a gun in her face and he's attempting to attack her and rape her. Whatever ends up going down, again, those both those stories are a little convoluted, but what we end up happening at the end, the result turns out to be that they drop the rape charge and then reduce the attempted rape charge to an assault charge, which Robert Hansen pled guilty to. So the short of it is somehow this all got reduced. And now Robert Hansen, who has two incidents that point to him being a violent sexual offender He's now only serving six months in prison. That's because the system tends not to believe females. So this ends up being a conviction for assault with a dangerous weapon. That's bullshit. It was supposed to be a five-year sentence. So they didn't let him off easy on the sentence itself. 
But it was a five-year sentence with a recommendation that Hansen receive psychiatric treatment. It was after the six months, after serving six months, that he was transferred to a halfway house and placed on a work release program. One year later, Hansen was released on parole, and parole was terminated after approximately three years. Yeah, again, two, two big crimes that he basically gets a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Well, the victims are probably traumatized for the rest of their freaking lives. Now, remember, this required him to receive psychiatric treatment during his time in prison. Mm -hmm. And so during this psychiatric treatment, the court ordered psychiatric treatment. What we learn is this was this was carried out by a Dr. J. Landon stated that Robert Hansen suffered from a dissociative mental illness and suggested that Robert Hansen's criminal activity stemmed from that illness and stated that Hansen's type of disorder was difficult to treat successfully, but a subsequent letter from Dr. Alan Parker filed eight months later indicated that Hansen had made sufficient improvement through therapy to warrant his release on parole. Unbelievable. So you have one doctor saying this guy's got some issues mm -hmm. that we find are going to be very difficult to treat successfully. And then another doctor saying at a later date, he's been treated successfully. Yeah. We can send him out to parole. I fixed him. Now there's one thing that is left out of that little statement. And that that's actually, these are statements. What I just read were found they're from court um, documents. What wasn't in those court documents is a statement that he made during the course of this psychiatric evaluation where he told the doctor that during his teenage years, and of course, I think he's being a little deceptive here, but he says during his teenage years, he, he often fantasized about doing all sorts of harmful things to girls and women who rejected him. Yeah, he seems stable. That's not the end of his police sheet here, Captain. Because in 1977, Robert Hansen stole a chainsaw from a store in Anchorage. For this, Robert Hansen entered a plea of guilty to larceny in a building. He was sentenced to five years incarceration with the provision that he be eligible for parole at the earliest possible date and that he receive psychiatric therapy to case his transition back into the community. Now, hold on a second. I just want to point this out. Assault with a deadly weapon, five years. Stealing a chainsaw, five years. You can't even begin to compare those crimes. Correct. And keep in mind, had that been, had the, the theft been his first charge, you know, mm -hmm. the first time breaking the law, he would have got a lot less for that. He probably would have got probation maybe one year max, but because he had had multiple offenses and you know, they, they were aware of that. They're going to give him the five years for that theft charge. They should do shock therapy on his balls. The way that, that I, I want to go through that, that theft charge, because we have some detailed information on how that went down based off of the court records. So this took place while Hanson was shopping at an Anchorage department store when a store security guard observed Robert acting suspiciously in the store's sporting goods section. He watched Robert place an old sales receipt on a chainsaw box and leave it, leave the store with it. The guard apprehended Robert in the parking lot. Robert Hansen described his thoughts leading up to the shoplifting as follows. Quote, I looked at them and remembered about five weeks previous my father and I had been cutting wood for our fireplace and his remarking three or four times how much he would like to have one, meaning a saw. My folks live in Oregon and were visiting us for four weeks. He wanted a saw to use when he and my mother go camping along the coast. Mm -hmm. I told my father that he would be more than welcome to take mine, but he refused. I thought of this and all the presents my parents had given me through the years and how wonderful it would be if I could give him a saw for Christmas. I also thought of course about my life at that time. My wife and I had just bought this 
summer a new home and put everything we've had saved for more than nine years into that home. I guess many, many thoughts went through my mind as I looked at the saws. I wanted almost more than anything to please my father and could just imagine the expression on his face on Christmas Day if I could give him that saw. I walked around the store some more and out the front door. Outside, a man had just had a heart attack. The police, fire department, and paramedics were there to give him treatment. My father is 69 years old and has had one heart attack and is very overweight. Again, I thought of the chainsaw and how pleased he would be to receive it at Christmas. I walked back into the store, again to the saws. I thought there was a young man watching me, but then he seemed to disappear. On the one box that I picked up, there was a sales receipt. I guess this is when I first really seriously thought about taking the saw. It seemed like nobody would know if I paid for the saw or not if they saw a sales receipt on the box. I took the saw and walked out the door, and I was apprehended and arrested. I know what I did was wrong and I am very sorry for doing so. Robert Hansen was 37 years old at the time of the offense, and he had children. He's married. His family has this bakery. He's successful. He could afford to buy his father a saw. I was going to say not successful enough to buy a saw. Maybe not, but the way I see it, Captain, is I'm seeing a guy who is manipulating those around him when yeah, he's, he's when a liar. He's, right. When he's caught, when he's innocent, whatever. He's a man who cheats and he's a liar. When he was caught for burning down the building, he was able to convince his parents and his wife, hey, I'm just the fall guy. Didn't really have anything to do with this. Convince them so much so that once they put him behind bars, they still believed him. Now, He's standing in front of a judge at 37, giving him this sad story about his father's and bad health and what a miracle it would be if I could just give my father this one gift on Christmas morning. Like he's Tiny Tim from Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol or something. Yeah, it's just too bad you can't give your dad a new son. (laughs) That's right, Christian. So what we see here, I believe, is a guy trying to tell this and sell this sad story to a judge. The judge didn't believe it. And that's why he ends up getting the five years. This show is sponsored by better help. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot. And it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Angie's list is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. 
but those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is. And it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today. We're back. Cheers. And that's no lie. We switched over to some Um Hops. Mm-hmm. Mm, tasty. Thank you, Hanson Brothers. This uh, w- Go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, they're they're kind of similar to us because they have they have a garage themselves. I believe their company's called Three Door Garage or something. Oh. Or three car garage or something like that. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to laugh because I think most people own garages, but uh, what do I know? So, well, it's not a chainsaw, right? During this, during this prison sentence, and it ends up getting reduced, and he doesn't have to spend the full five years. But what ends up happening here? We did state that you know he has to undergo another psychiatric evaluation during this time, and this is when Robert Hansen is diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And of course, we got to keep in mind. This does not mean what we're going to end up learning about him. That's not typical of bipolar disorder. And also, given the time frame, we're talking about the 70s. So a lot has changed, and fortunately, we know more about things like this now than we did back then. At the time, he was prescribed lithium, which I don't know if that's still something that they hand out. I don't I don't yes. know much about it. He wasn't required by law to actually take it, but this will have, this will be interesting because we said that he owned a plane, right? He owned that plane that the victim led the officers to at the airfield. Right. So he owns this plane, but he was denied a license due to this medication that he was prescribed. Mm -hmm. Again, no one knows if he was actually taking the medication. I couldn't find anybody to say either way if he was actually taking it. But the way that he comes about buying this plane is pretty interesting because in the early 1980s, Robert Hansen reported a burglary at his home. He says that $13,000 worth of items were stolen from his family's home. It wasn't too long after this. It's a lot of chainsaws. That he purchased the Piper Super Cub Bush plane. Yeah. This is a very, very tiny plane. So the thought is maybe he used this money that he received from the insurance policy Mm -hmm. on the burglary to his home to buy the plane. That's a big part of the story. So now we're going back to the investigation. Is he responsible we have this sex worker that we found in handcuffs, a, a truck driver found her. Is he responsible for this? He's saying no. He's saying I don't know her. I've never seen her before. And he, he, I believe he has an alibi as well. Yeah, he has two alibis. So this makes it very difficult for the police because – if we're going to take this thing in front of a judge and say that this guy abducted and, and assaulted this woman, but she escaped. Well, if you put this thing in front of a judge or even a jury of his peers, you run the risk of going, well, it's this working girl's word against this successful family man, businessman mm-hmm. who says he doesn't even know her, never met her. And he's got two other people that are considered to be good upstanding citizens that are saying, well, he couldn't have done that because he was with us that night. The police are smarter than that, though. They know how things work. And even though they can't bring it in front of a judge yet, they're going to still work on Robert Hansen. And so they're going to question him. They want him to slip up. They want him to give them information that they can work with to build a case against him. At the same time, while they haven't officially filed any charges against him for the attack, for the rape and the abduction of Cindy Paulson, another body turns up. This is a couple months later, and this is Paula Golding's body turns up. 
So the police are really concerned, number one, that they got this violent guy out that they believe are 100% to be guilty of what Cindy Paulson said this guy did. There's too much evidence to them leading them to him. The problem is the alibi. And Hansen doesn't really admit anything when they first interview him. In fact, he's a little bit rude. When Detective Flothy asked him about the attack and the sexual assault, Hansen says to Flothy, you can't really rape a prostitute, can you? Well, Flothy fires right back and says, in this state, you can. So they're looking at this guy. I mean, that statement right there shows you what kind of respect he has for women. Well, in particular, the victim here in this case. Right. And maybe the other victims that you're seeing as well, the missing women and the bodies that are turning up. So what we have here, Captain, is more bodies turning up, a guy that's looking really good, and you got a couple detectives that are saying, you know what, look at this guy's past. He was a violent sexual offender before. That's what he still is today. We believe he abducted, raped, and was going to kill Cindy Paulson, but she was able to get away. We think he's responsible for a lot of these other ones. The other thing, too, that made Robert Hansen interesting to them is that he owned a plane because at least one or two of the bodies were described, and we went through those articles, described as inaccessible in an area that was inaccessible. Mm -hmm. However, if you had a plane, those areas were accessible. Right, but also think about it this way. Investigators are going, okay, yes, we know that she's a sex worker, but parts of her story line up. I went to this guy's house, then we went to a plane. This is the guy. Mm -hmm. And he has those items. Now you have these two alibis. So that's when the investigators are going to go, hey, somebody's lying, so we're going to we got to crack down on somebody. And like I said, her story is making some sense, so they're going to go after his alibi. Well, and keep in mind, too, I mean, yeah, when they find her, when police find her, she was still handcuffed. She was still beat up. Yeah, the scene to me is like the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the first one, where she runs out onto the road and she's screaming and yelling and comes across that uh, semi-truck driver. The problem, though, too, then becomes people that are familiar with cases such as this one, well, not such as this one, but such as the Cindy Paulson case of her escape, let's say. There are plenty, dozens, hundreds, thousands of cases where a dancer or a working girl gets beat up by a boyfriend or a pimp and blames it on someone else. That happens. Happens all the time. Police don't suspect that here, but that's where it could easily go to in the minds of people that are tasked with the duty of determining Robert Hansen's guilty or not. Right. Guilt or not. And you have these other people that are saying, well, he couldn't have because he was with us that night. We'll get into that in a minute. But what we're going to have here is very interesting because the police decide, well, let's build a case against Robert Hansen. He's our guy. If we all think that he's our guy, let's surveillance him. Let's watch him. Let's build a case against him. Well, what do we need to do? Let's forget about the, the rape and the abduction as far as Cindy Paulson's concerned. We can always circle back to that. Let's try to connect him to the murdered victims or to any of the missing women. So let's build our case against him that way. One thing that they do is they reach out to the FBI in Quantico. And they actually didn't think that they were going to have any good result with this. They just made a simple phone call and said, hey, this is what's happening here in Anchorage. We got these women missing, turning up dead. This is how they're found. Oh, and by the way, we got a guy that we like for this. Roy Hazelwood, who we referenced in the trailer was the man that picked up the phone, the FBI agent that picked up the phone. Mm -hmm. He tells the officer, the detective, he says, don't tell me anymore. I don't want to know who your guy is. Tell me about the victims and how you're finding them. Roy Hazelwood starts to shoot off back and he says, I bet you your guy is like this. And I bet you he does this. And he's about this age. And this is where he lives. He's probably married. He's probably successful. He's probably known in the community. Mm -hmm. He's telling them everything that they already know to be true about Robert Hansen. Hazelwood says, you know what? Take this to the local FBI. 
get them to sign off on it, and we will send you some agents. Okay, so this next part is from the Criminal Minds fandom page, which is an odd and unexpected source for this week's case, but turned out to be a very good source. The information is real good and laid out nicely, so I was happy to find it. There's a paragraph that says the Alaskan investigators began looking into Hansen again and contacted the FBI, who sent in their profilers. This was, according to the site here, Captain, says John Douglas, but some sources say it was Roy Hazelwood. They profiled that the killer would have low self-esteem, a history of rejection by women, and be an experienced hunter. They also correctly predicted that he would take souvenirs from his victims and would have a stutter. So let's examine this for a bit and clear up any of the Douglas versus Hazelwood bit as well. For the record, the fandom page is citing sources, so they don't have anything wrong. They are just simply citing other sources. Right. So they included both, which I think is very responsible. They say it was either Roy Hazelwood or John Douglas that helped the Anchorage police and the state police, the Alaska state police with this case. Yeah, I agree. It's good that they put both of those in there. So first off, anyone that has listened to the show for a long period of time know that John Douglas and Roy Hazelwood are the two FBI agents that we have talked about more than any others by far. Yeah, Hazelwood was my nickname in high school. We have referenced, quoted, and explored their works countless times. They are both OGs when it comes to the FBI's BSU. They worked together and relied on each other's work at time and expertise plenty, as have we. I can see why this part is confusing, and the short answer is because they both worked on the case. So it makes sense that you would see Douglas's name and or Roy Hazelwood's name. The other truth about the FBI's profile is that in this case, the FBI was only brought in after local law enforcement already identified who they believe to be the killer, which is pretty rare, right? The In this case, the Alaska state troopers and the Anchorage police pretty much knew or had that gut feeling that Robert Hansen was the one that was killing women. Mm -hmm. Again, in fact, they were calling him Bad Bob Hansen. But they needed some experts to help them secure a search warrant for Bad Bob. This would be to search his home, his plane, and his three vehicles that he owned at the time. So FBI agents John Douglas and Jim Horn were sent from Quantico out to Anchorage to assist. The Alaskan authorities attempted on more than one occasion to get a search warrant for Hansen, but needed more ammunition as the DA wanted to make sure that the courts wouldn't find that the police were going on a fishing expedition, right? Saying, hey, we think this guy's killed all these people. We're just going to go in and toss his house and search the plane and hope to find stuff that lead us to building a case against him. Right. So John Douglas and Jim Horn shipped out to Anchorage, brought in to put together a psychological and behavioral profile of the offender. Well, one of the things that I think about Hanson, and that's such a a tee ball shot, you know, put the ball on the tee and hit it out of the park is – we we know that he's a hunter and that he collects trophies and he collects uh, parts of the animals as trophies. So if he's killing multiple women, why wouldn't he keep souvenirs or trophies of those kills as well? Well, and really what they wanted was to say, you know what, we brought in these outside experts who on their own put together their own psychological profile of who the offender would be, what his behaviors would be, personality would be. And then we can take that and say, you know what? They created this independently. We're telling the judge, hey, look, this matches Robert Hansen. This matches the guy that we've been trying to go after and we can't get a search warrant for. And so once they have that, they also want something else from the FBI. These guys have worked these type of serial cases. So these guys can put together a list for them of very specific items that they need to include on their search warrant when they go looking for items at his home. So in general, that was really the main job of John Douglas and Jim Horn to put together 
the search warrant information, items they were searching for, and the profile on the suspect that would commit these types of crimes. Mm -hmm. This all works. And the DA goes for the search warrant. Judge grants the searches. They're going to go hunting, let's say, at Robert Hansen's house. Now, where Roy Hazelwood comes back into play, not only did he answer the call and encourage the local authorities to pursue the FBI to get involved, was at some point during this case, John Douglas, he's hospitalized. And this is for quite some time. And it took place during the Robert Hansen case. Douglas nearly died from stress. And you texted me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, I'm seeing stuff saying that they're working on season three of Mindhunter. Look at the time frame that we're talking about here. Yeah. This would line up with where they kind of left off on season two. They might start working the Hansen case in season three and we'll see Douglas's character in the hospital at some point. Yeah. Again. So, so Douglas is nearly down for the count. So mm-hmm. Roy Hazelwood is sent in to cover for Douglas. And what he's going to do is he's going to prepare the detectives that will be interviewing Robert Hansen after his arrest. He's going to be telling them, hey, these are the tips and things that you can use to try to get a confession from him. Or if you can't get him to willingly confess, here's some tactics that you can use to get him to slip up Mm -hmm. and give you information that you need unwillingly. Captain, before we move on too far, and while we're passing around some credit, we need to make sure that we give a big batch of it to Alaska State Trooper Detective Glenn Flothy and Anchorage PD Officer Greg Baker. Both Flothy and Baker were extremely determinated to catch whoever it was that was killing these women and burying them out in the woods. Determined. These were the guys that suspected Hansen was the right guy when others were dismissing him. And they didn't treat the victims alive or otherwise any differently than they would any other citizen of the community. Here's what they wanted to do, Captain. And this is genius because they're like, you know what? If we can find items that our rape and assault victim says she saw in this man's house, the gun that he used on her and other items that he used on her, that's going to be enough for us to really take this to the next level. The next level is put this case in front of a grand jury. That's where those false alibis will come back into play. And we'll circle back to that. But the other thing that they wanted to do, detectives aren't stupid. They see that this guy, he filed this insurance claim for $13,000 and then in pretty quick turnaround buys an airplane. Uh, Okay, well, when you submit your report to the insurance company, you have to uh, submit an itemized list of everything that was stolen from your property. You now have an abduction and rape victim who says, I was in the basement and she's describing items that he had put on that list of things that were stolen from his home. So now you have an insurance fraud charge that you can bring against this guy. So when you have trouble convincing a room of people that this man is a serial killer who's killed dozens of women. Mm -hmm. What, what is the best thing for you? Time, time will be on your side, but you're afraid he will be killing other women in the process or could be destroying evidence in the process. So if we can lock this dude up on anything, the insurance fraud charge, the rape charge, the abduction charge, let's get him on that put his ass behind bars and build a case against him while we have him locked up. Sure enough, they get into his home. They start seeing things that he says were stolen from his house that he received insurance money for. Yeah. I mean, this guy's is a criminal on multiple levels. He doesn't really care for anybody's concern other than his and make sure that he's getting ahead. The thing they really wanted to find was that 223 Ruger Mini 14, which is the gun that they found the shell casings near a couple of the buried bodies. So they were hoping to find that in this search. They would eventually find it. And the other thing that comes about 
is now they are taking this case to a grand jury. So they can go back to those two guys who say that I was with Robert Hansen that night. He couldn't have abducted and raped this woman. And they can say, you know what? You told us that story. Now here's your subpoena. You go tell it to a grand jury. And if later we can prove that you are lying, you will be doing time yourself. Well, how quickly they changed their stories. Neither of those men were with Robert Hansen that night. Liars. Pants on fires. I want to say that they got a couple search warrants and looked through things and didn't find anything. And then they went, got a couple different search warrants and went back. Because they didn't find anything like just like out in the open. I think they were coming up empty most of the time. And then they found like some kind of hidden area in his attic or something like that. Well, you're, you're exactly right. Um, now, but it's a little confusing because think about the search warrants in general, they are seeking items that would be involved in different charges related to different incidents, things that took place at different times. Right. So some of the items they are finding out in the open, these would be the items that he claimed were stolen during the burglary, the house burglary, right? Because he's, He's very fond of his trophies, his hunting trophies. And a lot of the valuable items that he says were stolen from his home are, in fact, those hunting trophies that he's got mounted to the walls. So not only were they out in the open, they were on display, and he was proud to show them off. So they find those right away, but all that's going to get you in court is a charge for this insurance fraud. They want charges of murder, rape, and abduction. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. They're not finding the guns and the torture weapons or dirty shovels or anything like that out in the open that would lead them to be able to bring forward those types of charges. What they end up finding, and it's a weird situation because, and it's really great that Roy Hazelwood was able to kind of school these detectives and and prosecutors in how they should be communicating and talking and interviewing Robert Hansen. Because what they do is they bring him in for interrogation at the same time that they're searching his home, his property, and his vehicles. Well, it's a great time to bring him in because he would know that they're searching. So he's going to be constantly worried the whole time that they're asking him questions. What are they finding? Well, and the stutter, and I don't want people to email me. I don't know the science of any of this. But in this situation... What they're going with is that the man's stutter seems to be directly related to how nervous he gets, how out of control a situation gets for him. And when he's uncomfortable, when he's nervous, when the stakes are high, he stutters. He can't control himself. He reacts. And so what they wanted is just what you said, Captain. Let him know we're searching his properties. Let's bring him in. Let's question him at the same time while the t- the heat is already cranked up to 10. And what they get are some information because, as you said, they're turning up empty-handed with the items that would lead them to the more severe charges, the, su- the charges that they're really, they really care about. They don't right. really care about the insurance fraud other than to jam them up long enough to bring these other charges. They end up finding through some of his own words, Robert Hansen's own words, that he has a false wall at some at some place in his home. It might have been the basement, it might have been the attic, might have been both. And inside of that false wall, he had hid things like guns that he had used and things that he had used to torture some of these women. They also found an aviation map, which was really interesting because it had uh, several things marked on this map. And I believe it was about 21 or 20 or so things marked on the map. Having found this, they already know where some of the bodies were recovered. The bodies that they've recovered are matching up with some of the marks that Robert Hansen made on this map. They know Robert Hansen made these marks on this map because he said he told them where to find the map. And where to find these other items? They're in the false walls. The gun they were looking for is this uh, 223 Ruger Mini 14 that they know was used to kill a couple of the victims. They didn't find it in any of the properties that they were searching because it was in his boat, which was, in fact, on his property. But they didn't have a search warrant for the boat. 
This So that's where they had to go back and get a search warrant for the boat. They couldn't afford to anything being found in the boat to be thrown out of court at mm-hmm. a later date. So this sh- shit turd had a plane and a boat. Yeah. But keep in mind, it it is Alaska, so like plane ownership is a lot more common there, and right. these smaller planes. And they're small. It was a small boat. It wasn't like a yacht. No. It's still a shit turd. In the end, when they find the gun and run ballistics, they are able to come back and tell him, you know what, this gun, your which was his prized gun, which oddly enough, the profilers said he would have this very close relationship with the the murder weapon and he would value this over many many other items in his possession he would treat it with a certain high intensity level of care when they said to him look we've we've connected the bullets from your favorite gun to four of the victims that's when they get a confession from robert hansen and It's a pretty long one, but I've reviewed it, and the short of it is basically he's saying that women that work the streets, women that work as dancers, they're not good people. And so it didn't really matter that he killed them, that he should be allowed to do whatever he wanted with them Mm -hmm. because they're not the same as you and I or everybody else. So they don't have the same rights as he does. Oddly enough, he doesn't consider himself to be a bad person or didn't at the time of his arrest, which is completely bizarre giving his police record and what he was out doing all those years. Yeah, but he's fixed with therapy. And he would end up pleading guilty to this in the court of law, and he ended up receiving a life sentence plus 461 years so he was never going to get out and then part of that plea bargain now Alaska does not have the death penalty so that was never going to be an issue but part of that plea bargain was he was going to have to tell the officers where they could expect to find the remaining victims right but but he would never be charged with those crimes he could only be charged with the four murders Correct. That, that he was confessing to. He was charged with four murders, convicted of four murders. One of them is Eklutna Annie, who's never been identified. He doesn't know who she was or claims that he doesn't know who she was. And he was also charged and convicted of the insurance fraud as well as the abduction and assault on Cindy Paulson. So that's how you get a life sentence plus 461 years. He confessed to 17 murders overall. They recovered all of those bodies. There still are some bodies that have not been recovered. Uh, And I'm getting a little confused. I shouldn't say they recovered all of the 17. Police believe that he's probably responsible for 21 or more murders. And they think that the reason why he wouldn't confess to some of the other murders goes back to his original confession that some of the women weren't working at a show bar or weren't working the streets. Right. And therefore, for whatever reason, we've gone through this time and time again with these serial killers. Their confessions don't always make a lot of sense. Sometimes they make up higher numbers. Sometimes they really downplay it. Yeah. And I'd also say possibly in this case, there would be victims closer to the age of maybe 12 to 14 and a lot of times you'll see serial killers not willing to admit that they they killed a child. Yeah, the missing women that they have that are still outstanding to this date are of the age range of the, the previous victims that we've already discussed. Part of that, you wonder if they were just left out in the open or tossed into the river, which is a little bizarre that he didn't use that time and time again. These other crimes he was not willing to confess to those for whatever reason detectives were also very concerned and remember we saw this in the btk the btk case as well how can you have this serial killer operating for years and years and years living with his family and nobody else knows about what he's out doing and so one thing that they had to do was interview his wife extensively 
not telling her what they're going to charge him with because they wanted to be able to determine if she had any clue of what old bad Bob Hansen was up to. What they discovered is that she traveled a lot. She was a good person. She had no clue of what he was doing. He was doing almost all of this while she was away on travel with the kids. In fact, in a lot of these murders, he called them his summertime projects, which she would be out traveling for the summer. I believe she was a teacher or something and had the summers off. But she also even tried to help the police once she was aware of what he was guilty of. Once he confessed, she even helped them try to locate some more of his items that he may have concealed somewhere or buried on their properties. So she was just another victim in this long story of Robert Hansen. But this guy, again, he's, you know, he's beyond a monster because not only was he raping these individuals, to take an individual out and give them a head start. Here, I'll give you a knife, or maybe I don't give you a knife. Maybe I leave you handcuffed. Maybe I take the handcuffs off, but I'm going to hunt you down like an animal. That's what they really should have done. They should have got him to confess, and then they should have said, hey, by the way, we're going to take you out to the field where where we found a body, and they should have just said, hey, uh, Robert, we're going to give you little head start and uh, we'll be coming for you. Well, and that's one thing that they were able to determine captain was in the earlier murders, he was killing the victims elsewhere and then bringing them to the burial sites in the later murders. He's all wrapped up and in love with this hunting. It's like, well, why not combine the couple things that I love the most, right? Abduct this woman. A lot of the physical attacks, the, the rapes and such sexual assaults, took place at his home. And then the the ruse of, oh, I take these women to a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. That's He's just putting them in a plane so he can land that thing and go hunt them out in the wilderness and then bury them where he kills them. And I want to be very clear about this. We told this story in the trailer about General Zaroff, who if you were able to elude him for three days and get away from him and his hunting dogs – that he would set you free and he gave them a knife and some food and a three hour head start. That's not the case with Robert Hansen. No, he's, he's hunting women who he lets out of his airplane, who in many cases are naked, still handcuffed and sometimes even blindfolded. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this guy was giving them any type of fair situation at all. To, to get free, he was setting up a system and stacking the deck against them so he could hunt them for fun with no worry that they were going to get away. Yeah. Sickening. Exactly. And I think some of the words from the trial really sum up Hanson the best. And this is from the closing statements before he was sentenced to that lengthy prison sentence. And this is coming from the prosecuting attorneys. And they're talking about the victims and Robert Hansen. And they say 17 may not be the end of it, meaning there could be more victims. We feel from what we've learned that there might be more bodies out there. And then the prosecutor points to Robert Hansen and says, before you sits a monster, an extreme aberration of a human being who has walked amongst us. Not even his wife of 20 years had any inkling of his dark, evil side. His crimes numb the mind. Alaska serial killer Robert Hansen, who killed as many as 21 women, maybe more, died around 1.30 a.m. August 21st, 2014 at an Anchorage hospital. The cause of death appeared to be that he died of natural causes. Glenn Flothy, a retired Alaska state trooper, who was instrumental in Hansen's 1984 capture, said, quote, On this day, we should only remember his many victims and all of their families, and my heart goes out to all of them. As far as Hansen is concerned, this world is better without him. Thank 
you so much, friends, for joining us here again in the garage. I'm getting right up in your ear. If you need more True Crime Garage, check out our other show, our bonus show, called Off the Record, If You're Nasty. And that's on Stitcher Premium. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading this week? This week we are recommending Death on Ocean Boulevard Inside the Coronado Mansion case by Caitlin Rother. This is perfect timing as well to recommend this book because this case is coming up on the 10-year marker now. This, unfortunately, is one of those true crime mysteries. Was it murder or was it suicide? Rebecca Zahau's family believes she was murdered as investigators found conflicting evidence of foul play. In this book, author Caitlin Rother explores all the theories that point to foul play and brings out some new details about the case. Check out Death on Ocean Boulevard, find that title, and many, many more on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. Again, friends, we can't thank you enough for joining us here every week in the garage. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't let it. you can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.